Ether, God, and Devil. <clears throat> Cosmic Superimposition. A quick quote by Wilhelm Reich. Love, work, and knowledge are the wellsprings of our life. They should also govern it. Another quote by Goethe. What is the hardest thing of all? That which seems the easiest for your eyes to see, that which lies before your eyes. Goethe. Chapter 1. The Workshop of Organomic Functionalism. The cosmic orgone energy was discovered as a result of consistent application of the functional technique of thinking. It was these methodic, rigidly controlled thought processes that led from one fact to another, weaving across a span of about 25 years seemingly disparate facts into a unified picture of the function of nature. A picture which is submitted to the verdict of the world as the still unfinished doctrinal framework of orgonomy. <clears throat> Hence, it is necessary to describe the functional technique of thinking. It is useful not only to allow the serious student of the natural sciences to see the result of research, but also to initiate him into the secrets of the workshop, in which the end product, after much toil and effort, is shaped. I consider it an error in scientific communication that most of the time merely the polished and flawless results of natural research are displayed, as in an art show. An exhibit of the finished product alone has many drawbacks and dangers for both its creator and its users. The creator of the product will be only too ready to demonstrate perfection and flawlessness, while concealing gaps, uncertainties, and discordant contradictions of his insight into nature. He thus belittles the meaning of the real process of natural research. The user of the product will not appreciate the rigorous demands made on natural scientists when the latter has to reveal and describe the secrets of nature in a practical way. He will never learn to think for himself and to cope by himself. Very few drivers have an accurate idea of the sum of human efforts, of the complicated thought processes and operations needed for manufacturing an automobile. Our world would be better off if the beneficiaries of work knew more about the process of work and the experience of the workers if they did not pluck so thoughtlessly the fruits of labor performed by others. <clears throat> In the case of ergonomy, a look into a corner of the workshop is particularly pertinent. The greatest difficulty in understanding the organ theory lies in the fact that the discovery of the organ has solved too many problems at once and problems that were too vast. The biological foundation of emotional illnesses, biogenesis, and with it, the cancer biopathy, the ether, the cosmic longing of the human animal, a new kind of physical energy, etc. There was always too much going on in the workshop, too many facts, too, too many facts, new causal connections, corrections, updated and inaccurate viewpoints, connections with various branches of specialized research in the natural sciences. Hence, I often had to defend myself against the criticism that I had overstepped scientific limits <clears throat> that I had undertaken too much at one time. I did not undertake too much at one time. I did not undertake too much at a time, and I did not overreach myself scientifically. No one has felt this charge of too much more painfully than I have. I did not set out to trace the facts. The facts and interrelations flowed toward me in superabundance. I had trouble treating them with due attention and putting them in good order. Many, many facts of great significance were lost that way. Others remained uncomprehended. But the essential and basic facts about the discovery of cosmic orgone energy strike me as a sufficiently secure and systemized for others to continue building the structure I could not complete. The multitude of new facts and interrelations particularly the relationship of the human animal to his universe, can be explained by a very simple analogy. <clears throat> Did Columbus discover New York City or Chicago, the fisheries in Maine, the plantations in the South, the vast waterworks, or the natural resources on America's West Coast? He discovered none of this, built none of it, did not work out any details. He merely discovered a stretch of seashore that set up to then was unknown to Europeans. The discovery of this coastal stretch <clears throat> on the Atlantic Ocean was the key to everything that over several centuries became North America.
Columbus's achievement consisted not of building America, but of surmounting seemingly immovable prejudices and hardships, preparing for his voyage, carrying it out, and landing on alien, dangerous shores. The discovery of cosmic energy occurred in a similar fashion. In reality, <clears throat> I have made only one single discovery, the function of orgastic plasma pulsation. It represents the coastal stretch from which all else developed. It was far more difficult to overcome human prejudice in dealing with a biophysical basis of emotions, which are man's deepest concern, than to make the relatively simple observation about bions or to cite the equally simple and self-evident fact that the cancer biopathy rests on the general shrinking and decomposition of the living organism. <clears throat> what is the hardest thing of all? That which seems the easiest for your eyes to see, that which lies before your eyes, as Goethe put it. What has always astounded me is not the organ, is not that the organ exists and functions, but that for over 20 millennia it was so thoroughly overlooked or argued away when every few life-asserting scholars cited and described it. In one, asked, in one respect, the discovery of the orgone differs from the discovery of America. Orgone energy functions in all human beings and before all eyes. America first had to be found. An essential and comprehensive part of my activities <clears throat> in the workshop lay in learning to understand why people in general and natural scientists in particular recoil from so basic a phenomena as the orgastic pulsation. Another part of my work, which brought down on me much dirt, dust, and plain garbage, consisted of feeling, experiencing, understanding, and overcoming the bitter hatred among friends and foes alike that formed a roadblock everywhere to my orgasm research. I believe that biogenesis, the ether question, the life function, and human nature would long ago have been conquered by many scientific workers if these basic questions of natural science had not had but one access <clears throat> the orgastic plasma pulse, pulsation when i succeeded in concentrating on a single problem for three decades mastering it and orienting myself within its fundamental natural function in spite of all obstacles and personal attacks i began to realize that i had transcended the conceptual framework of the existing human character structure and with it our civilization during the past five thousand years Without wanting to, I found myself outside its limits, hence I had to expect that I would not be understood if I produced the simplest and most easily verifiable facts and interconnections. I found myself in a new different realm of thought, which I first had to investigate before I could go on. This orientation in the new functional realm of thought, in contrast to the mechanistic mystical realm of patriarchal civilization, took about 14 years, roughly from 1932 to the writing of this work, 1946 and 1947. My writings <clears throat> have often been criticized for being far too compressed, <clears throat> forcing the reader to make a strenuous effort at concentration. It has been said that people prefer to enjoy an important book in the same way that they enjoy beautiful scenery while cruising at leisure in a comfortable car. People do not want to race toward a specific goal in a straight line at lightning speed. I admit that I might have presented the function of the orgasm in a thousand instead of three thousand. Whoops. I admit that I might have presented the function of the orgasm in a thousand instead of three hundred pages and the organ therapy of the cancer biopathy in five hundred instead of one hundred pages. I further admit that I never trouble to familiarize my readers completely with the conceptual and investigative methods on which the results of orgonomy are based. No doubt this has caused me no doubt this has caused much damage. I claim extenuating circumstances insofar as I opened up several scientific fields over the decades, which I first had to set down in a condensed, systematic form in order to keep up with the development of my research. I know that I have built no more than the scaffold and foundation of my structure, <clears throat> that windows, doors, and important interior features are missing in many places, and that it does not offer a com comfortable abode. I ask to be excused because of the pioneer nature of the basically different of this basically different research. I had to gather my scientific treasures rapidly wherever and however I found them. This happened during the brief intervals between six changes of domicile, forced upon me by partly by peaceful circumstances. 
but partly by extremely violent social upheavals. Furthermore, <clears throat> I constantly had to start from scratch in earning a living, first in Germany in 1930, then in Copenhagen in 1933, in Sweden and Norway in 1934, twice in the same year, and in the United States in 1939. In retrospect, I ask myself how I succeeded in accomplishing anything essential at all. For almost two decades, I lived and worked on the run, so to speak. All this precluded a congenial and secure atmosphere, without which it is impossible to give congenial extensive descriptions of discoveries. I must reject another criticism, namely that I unnecessarily provoke the public by the word orgasm in the title of a book. There is no reason whatever for being ashamed of this function. Those who are squeamish about it need not read further. The rest of us cannot allow others to dictate the limits of scientific research. When I began this book, I planned to make it up. I planned to make up for what I had denied to myself and others for so long in terms of breadth and more graphic presentation. <clears throat> I hope I will now be spared the criticism that I have taken my research too seriously by giving it too much space. Since everything in nature is interconnected in one way or another, the subject of organomic functionalism is practically inexhaustible. It was essentially the humanistic and scientific achievements of the 19th and early 20th centuries that merged with my interest in studies of the natural sciences to form the living body of work that eventually took useful and applicable shape as organomic functionalism. Although the functional technique of thinking will be described here systematically for the first time, it was nevertheless applied by many scholars more or less consciously before it definitely overcame in the form of organomy the hitherto rigid limits of natural research. <clears throat> I would like to mention the names of those to whom I am primarily indebted. Koster, Dostoevsky, Lang, Nietzsche, Morgan, Darwin, Engels, Seaman, Bergson, Freud, Malinowski, Malinowski, among others. When I said earlier that I found myself in a new realm of thought, this does not mean that organomic functionalism was ready and merely waiting for me, or that I could simply appropriate Bergson's or angles conceptual technique and apply it smoothly to the area of my problem. The formation of this thought technique was in itself a task I had to accomplish in practical act activity as a physician and scientist struggling against the mechanistic and mystical interpretations of living matter. Thus, I have not developed a new philosophy that adjacent to or in conjunction with other philosophies try to bring the processes of life closer to human comprehension. As soon oops, as some of my friends believe, no, there is no philosophy involved at all. Rather, we are dealing with a tool of thought that we must learn to apply before investigating the substance of the life of life. Organomic functionalism is not some luxury article to be worn or taken off at one's direction. It consolidates the conceptual laws and functions of perception that must be mastered if we are to allow children and adolescents to grow up as life-affirmative human beings in this world. If we want to bring the human animal into harmony again with this natural constitution and the nature surrounding him, one can oppose such a goal on philosophical or religious grounds. One can declare, purely philosophically, that a unity of nature and culture is impossible or harmful, harmful or unethical or unimportant. But no one can claim any longer that splitting up of the human animal into a cultural and a private being into a representative of higher values and an organotic energy system does not, in the truest sense of the word, undermine his health, does not harm his intelligence, does not destroy his joy of living, does not stifle his initiative, does not plunge his society time and again into chaos. The protection of life demands functional thinking in contrast to mechanistics and mysticism. As a guideline in this world, just as traffic safety demands good brakes and flawlessly working signal lights, I would like to confess to the most rigid scientific ordering of freedom here. Neither philosophy nor ethics, but to the protection of social functioning will determine whether a child of four can experience his first genital ex excitations with or without anxiety. A physician, educator, or social administrator can have only one opinion, not five, about the sadistic or pornographic fantasies a boy or girl develops during puberty under the pressure of moralism. It is not a question of philosophical possibilities, but of social and personal necessities to prevent by all possible means the deaths 
of thousands of women from cancer of the uterus because they were raised to practice abstinence because thousands of cancer researchers do not want to acknowledge this fact or will, will not speak up for fear of ostracism. It is a murderous philosophy that still favors the suppression of natural life functions in infants and adolescents. If we trace the origins and wide ramifications of public opinion, especially with respect to the personal life of the human masses, we find time and again the ancient classic philosophies about life, the state, absolute values, the universal spirit. They are all accepted uncritically in an era that has degenerated into chaos because of these harmless philosophies, an era in which the human animal has lost his orientation and self-confidence and senselessly gambles away his life. Thus, we are not concerned about philosophies, but what, but about practical tools crucial to the reshaping of human life. What is at stake is the choice between good and bad tools in rebuilding and reorganizing human society. A tool alone cannot do his work. A tool alone cannot do this work. Man must create the tools for mastering nature. Hence, it is the human character structure that determines how the tool will be made and what purpose it will serve. The armored, mechani ugh, good God. The armored mechanistically rigid person thinks mechanistically produces mechanistic tools and forms a mechanistic conception of nature. The armored person who fills his organotic body excitations in spite of his biological rigidity but does not understand them is mystic man. He is interested not in material but in spiritual things. He forms a mystical supernatural idea about nature. Both the mechanist and the mystic stand inside the limits and conceptual laws of a civilization which is ruled by a contradictory and murderous mixture of machines and gods. This civilization forms the mechanistic mystical structures of man, men and the mechanistic mystical character structures keep reproducing a mechanistic mystical civilization. Both mechanists and mystics find themselves inside the framework of human structure in a civilization conditioned by mechanistics and mysticism. They cannot grasp the basic problems of this civilization because their thinking and philosophy correspond exactly to the condition they project and continue to reproduce in order to realize the power of mysticism one only one has only to think of the murderous conflict between hindus and muslims at the time india was divided to comprehend what mechanistic civilization means think of the age of the atom bomb organomic functionalism stands outside the framework of mechanistic mystical civilization it did not rise from the need to bury the civilization hence it is not a priori revolutionary organomic functionalism represents the way of thinking of the individual who is unarmored and therefore in contact with nature inside and outside himself the living human animal acts like any other animal i.e functionally armored man acts mechanistically and mystically organomic functionalism is the vital expression of the unarmored human animal his tool for comprehending nature this method of thinking and working becomes a dynamically progressive force of social development only by observing, criticizing, and changing mechanistic mystical civilization from the standpoint of the natural laws of life, and not from the narrow perspective of state, church, economy, culture, etc. Since within the intellectual framework of mechanistic mystical character structure, life itself has been misunderstood, abused, feared, and often persecuted. It is evident that organomic functionalism is outside the social realm of mechanistic civilization. Wherever it finds itself inside this realm, it must step out of it in order to function. And functioning means nothing but investigating understanding and protecting life as a force of nature at its inception organ biophysics processed the important insight that the functioning of living matter is simple that the essence of life is the vital functioning itself and that it has no transcendental purpose or meaning the search for the purposeful meaning of life stems from the armoring of the human organism which blots out the living function and replaces it with rigid formulas of life unarmored life does not look for a meaning or purpose for its existence for the simple reason that it functions spontaneously spontaneously meaningfully and purposefully without the command thou shalt oh that's crazy the interrelations between conceptual methods 
character structures and social limitations are simple and logical. They explain why, so far, all men who understood and battled for life in one form or another consistently found themselves frustrated outsiders, outside the conceptual laws that have governed human society for thousands of years and why they so often suffered and perished and where they seemed to penetrate. It can be consistently shown that the armored exponents of mechanistic mystical civilization time and again deprive their doctrines life affirmative element of its specific characteristics and embodied it into the existing conceptual framework by diluting or correcting it. This will be discussed at length elsewhere. Here it suffices to prove that functional thinking is outside the framework of our civilization because life itself is outside it, because it is not investigated but misunderstood and feared.